I'm really happy to be here. I had the chance to meet some of you before um, and early today, and there are some incredible innovators and thinkers in this room. And I'm here to talk about maybe one of the biggest challenges that we face when we are trying to bring a new type of innovation to the world, which is how do you build up the team and the culture to accomplish a vision you can barely imagine? A few years ago, uh, I was, uh, as you can see here, assembling with my first team uh, those IKEA tables, the famous kind of starter kit for, for startups. Um, but before we talk about teams, I'd like to go back to our pitch decks. Who here has a startup that, uh, that raised money or is trying to raise money right now? All right, so I'm sure you all have one of these slides, right? Like you have the competition nicely mapped out on these two axes usually with you know, an early stage startup that's actually Airbnb at the time when it was called Airbed and Breakfast. And when you think of it, I mean, that's what you present to investors. But when you think about it, you know that it usually, in reality, looks like this, which is the tiny startup facing this insane competition with dozens of incumbents that sometimes have tens of thousands of employees and huge budgets, and you're trying to figure out how to get into this mix. You usually have limited resources as well and a handful of people. Not to be cliche, but that reminds me of this. That reminds me of the David and Goliath kind of typical underdog story, where in fact, 3,000 years ago, no one dared to face the mighty warrior Goliath but this young kid, David, who had no formal training whatsoever, but as a shepherd, was used to fend off attacks. And he said, I'm going to go fight the mighty warrior. At the time, Saul told him, I'm going to give you my armor. You need to wear something. And David actually had a different idea. His idea was instead of facing the giant face to face like he expected, he used his sling that he knew how to use actually really well to shoot him with one stone with perfect precision and extremely high speed right in between the eyes of the giant, which knocked him off in an instant. So when you think of this, David may have been the original hacker. Now, this is very powerful in that 3,000 years ago, much later after that, in the 60s, I think hackers have evolved. This is a, a picture of one of my heroes, Richard Stallman, uh, the guy who created the, the Free Software Foundation and the basics of, of what we know today as Linux. And it was when the first computers, really big, clunky calculating machines, were installed at MIT, the AI labs, that we started seeing the first hacker culture to be called this way. But hacker at the time really is not about hacking into computer systems or stealing things from people. But hackers at the time were this, the strange guys who would stay up at night to get access to these machines and wouldn't take for granted the limits of technology. They were the first to build a hack that was building a chess game on a computer or figure out that you could use interactivity with a computer instead of just having them sealed off in a glass room in order to run some heavy calculation. Then a little bit later, you know, I, I grew up kind of doing computer stuff and hacking things on my own until I moved to Israel actually and at the age of 18 years old, I got a chance to join the intelligence unit in, in the military um, of, the, of the IDF, and that's where I saw hackers in a very different light. I was exposed to, after a long battery of tests, I got into these classrooms. In the classroom, they had this poster that said, nothing's impossible. Now, this sounded as cheesy as it may sound to you, but believe me that after a few days, I, it, was, it became part of our routine. Some of the smartest people around that used to be the smartest people in their classroom were suddenly not the smartest in the room anymore. And they have this amazing foolishness and naivety 
to literally know nothing and be 18 years old and being tasked with impossible problems and sometimes coming up with breakthroughs that are hard to imagine. And that's why, that's why I'd like to talk to you to, today about a way to unleash this extreme power, the best weapon we may have, which is the hacker value, the hacker power of not accepting the limit of technology to see beyond of what other people see when interacting with machines and to think about a framework that will enable you to identify, hire the type of people that you need and build a culture that keeps perpetuating that and unlocks this value. You know, a few of you said that they have startups and raising money. Venture capital is critical. You need it as you start and probably for a few more rounds until it's not as essential anymore. But culture capital, when you think of it, is a constant, something you need day by day from the first day to the last and thereafter. And this framework has one goal, which is to create the consistent ability to transcend rules, to make great things happen. Even if we're on a little budget, and even if we only have a handful of people, and if we're facing competition from you know, all these massive companies that seem to know what they're doing. So first, let's talk about how to hire hackers. This is one of my favorite quotes from this guy Stephen Levy who wrote about the heroes of the computer revolution and said that really hackers should be judged by their hacking and not bogus criteria such as degrees, age, race, or position. So when you put a hacker in the x-ray machine, I think you see something like that. Well, maybe not exactly like that, but the idea is that you want people, like you want to first of all look past a particular skill set that you think you need right now. You want to look for people with a bro broad range of skills that are highly skilled in many things because you want them to be able to adapt to different challenges and be able to collaborate with other people, but also with a deep expertise in one particular area, an area that showed true passion, satisfaction not just from being well compensated, but satisfaction from building better. So not just satisfaction from building, from building better than other people. Now this, are, this is what we're looking for. And most importantly of all, you need learning animals. You need learning animals because the rate of change keeps on increasing. But also the challenges that we know today that we face as a company will change very quickly. As soon as we solve today's challenges, tomorrow we'll present the new set of challenges that are hard to, exp and hard to expect. So now we know what they look like. We have to kind of work on ourselves. I think as, as founders, there's this paradox that on one end, we need to always believe and kind of have this nerves of steel that when we get up in the morning, we think that we're gonna take over the world and we get actually in this emotional roller coaster, right? And all day long we hear about problems and we get no's from so many people. And by the end of the day, you're totally crushed but you need to keep believing, if, even if you're, at times, the only one who does. But on the other end, we are in the business of unlocking secrets, of listening so well that when you look at something that, or you talk to someone that everybody has seen before, you will find an insight that no one else could find. And that's how you build great products. And this paradox is something that we need to be very aware of because in order to find these hackers, you need to go beyond, the, beyond the, the typical, beyond the resumes. We talk often about A players, right? Let's look for A players, A plus players. Some companies even write this in the job description. I don't know how it works. Maybe you look at it in your passport, you're like, oh, sorry, now I'm A minus. I guess I can't, I can't apply now. But now that we know what we're looking for, we have to broaden the scope and look for the people that may not qualify right now for the particular job that you need to fill, but the people that are going to create the fabric, the DNA of the company. And the first few hires, the first few hires are paramount. That's why we're going to talk about how to measure the hacker fit, because you probably heard of lean startup methodology. And 
it's common knowledge now that startups are about failing fast, as fast as possible. But I think if there's one thing you cannot afford to fail at, is your core team and your core culture. Because it can either bring you down consistently or bring you up consistently, whatever the challenge is. So we all know about the test that we usually provide to, to candidates. I want to talk about a different test. I want to talk about a test that actually is scary because it involves wasting time of many people at the company. A test that is actually collaborative. So when you bring someone to do your job, and we're not just talking about developers, we're talking about every position in a core team, you want to test the skills that we talked about. You want to be able to find these learning animals that show passion without using the P word. You want to see the people that at a task, at an actual problem to solve, you will leave this open-ended and you will have the person solve this problem together with the other people in the office asking questions and coming in interaction with as many people of the team. The added benefit is that if your team, while running this test that can take half a day at least, if not longer, is that the win is if the team actually co comes to you and tells you, we really want this guy, this guy is awesome. So just for example, with designers, we actually, after a first set of interviews, we will commission them for one week simulation in office where you actually pay them for the time, but they're actually gonna design a feature top to bottom. Obviously they cannot do it on their own, so they're gonna have to talk to the data people, product managers, developers, but by the end of this week, you know very well that that's the person you need or don't need. And by the way, it works both, way, both ways because this fit may not work from the other side, right? Maybe it's not the kind of environment that I want to work in, and you get to know that. Now, once you have the first few people, you need to figure out a way to unlock their value. And to do that, you need to build a culture and really think about it. And it's really hard to think about culture because we have so many other things to think about, and it's kind of this mushy and self thing. Well, the first step is to develop your identity. These are some company values. Maybe you recognize them. Maybe they are similar to the values that you see for your own company. Uh, any guess of what companies uh, they've been taken from? They've been pretty famous over the past few years. Uh, Okay, you know what happened to the first one, um, and the Wells Fargo one, um, it's more recent, but they just laid off over 5,000 employees for opening millions of, of accounts fraudulently on behalf of their customers, hitting their credit score rating and basically getting them hit with overdraft fees. Now, Enron actually had a 64-page ethics manual to go with it. And I think what it shows is that writing down a set of values or a code of ethics is not the way to change people's behavior. As a matter of fact, even when you drove on the way here, you know that well. We don't really take cues on our behavior from written notice, but rather from what other people do. So when we drive, we don't look as much at the speed limit as much as how other people drive and we adapt to this. On the other hand, if we look at some really great companies that are known for their culture, they figured out a way to really distill down what makes them, what make them truly unique. And figuring out a culture is starting with understanding your identity. And your identity is not just pretty. Your identity is, is, is a set of values that makes you you, with the advantages and disadvantages. And it's about being aggressively authentic. And by the way, it's putting ourselves in a dangerous position. Because at this point, some employees when the team grows larger, and definitely candidates, will not feel good and will not relate with the identity, but the ones who do will feel that this is the place that they have to be in and connect with the company's ethos in a much greater way. As a matter of fact, Zappos was very well known for, for their emphasis on culture and, and the way to deliver a service, wrote down their values only six years in. And the way the CEO did that is by emailing the employees and asking them. So it's not about an aspirational identity of who we would like to be in the kind of perfect self kind of thinking, but rather the core values of what makes us who we are because our differences as a company is our advantage. And that's how you can attract people despite uh, 
having maybe less to offer than the competition in terms of compensation um, and so forth. But you give them an identity and a purpose. And as we move towards a knowledge-based economy, we are much more dependent, more than ever, on people's will and good intention. Because work becomes much more amorphic. So the, the relative importance of money compensation becomes less than meaning and purpose. So if we do our job well as leaders, we've, we're building a stack for people. Starts with hiring the people themselves, obviously providing physical infrastructure, an office, an identity and a mission and direction. And what we're actually building is context. Because if you have these brilliant hackers in whatever position you hire them for, you want to provide them with the context, purpose, and identity in order to be autonomous, in order to surprise you with what they can come up with. You want to unlock their ability to think differently, creatively, in a smarter way, in a different way than others, to take things apart, to rebuild them in a faster, cheaper, greater way on any problem that the company is facing. Most of the time it's about building a product, sometimes it's about closing a deal or getting out of an impossible situation. By providing this constant transparency, you are basically leveraging this close knit of super smart people that you have in the room. And you know, you know that very well. At startups, you have thousands of decisions to make every day. And the problem with the thousand decisions is that 90, 999 of them are usually kind of meaningless. But there's one that can be make or break. You just don't know which. Now, when you're able to create this level of transparency and context, with this type of people, then what you've effectively created is a way to curate decisions. Because they're gonna hear what's going on and they're gonna be able to identify the issues, loopholes, or new ideas to tackle things. And that's extremely powerful. I was once abroad on a business trip and it turns out uh, that's what the team was doing. Um, and uh, but that, that kind of gave me an idea. Yeah, I'd just come back and realize that that's what they made on my office. I was thinking of this, of this question of how do you measure culture? I mean, a lot of us, we are, uh, you know, we like hard metrics, we like numbers. But how do you measure culture in some kind of KPI? Well, there are a bunch of, uh, yeah, it took me a month to take it out, by the way. So, you know, there are a bunch of engagement surveys that you can find online and all this stuff and many tools. But I would like to suggest a different approach for you guys to think about. And this approach is the troll meter. I guess I was inspired with what they've done with my office. Basically, what you look at is how much do people care? Because we just said that if we're successful in bringing the smartest people with all the great capabilities that we talked about and the ability to look at reality in a different way, and come up with a solution you couldn't expect, if they care, then they'll solve problems and they'll provide the value that you need. So, and how do you test that? How do you see that? Well, it could be from literally a product manager of yours is sending a spec via email. Are people really trolling him? Positive or negative feedback? If someone really disagrees with an approach, do you hear about it? When someone pushes new code into the system, is someone else on the team reviewing this code and, and putting together comments for, the, for, for, this, for this entry? I remember one of my first hires was, was, uh, used to be a VP engineering for about 15 years before joining the team that was at the time totally flat. And after literally three hours being in the office, he takes me outside and he says, come on, I don't understand. Like, why are they like trolling my code every day? Like, why are they writing all these things that I should do better and styling conventions and things like that? Like, these guys have less experience than I have. I said, you know what? You should go and thank this guy because he's giving you the greatest gift and the gift of feedback and really showing you that he cares. And if you can identify people who stop caring, that means that either they don't believe in your ability to make decisions or they just don't, simply don't care anymore. And that's a situation you have to remedi remedy immediately. And, um, and this is it. If we go and team up with the hackers and build this hacker mindset, thinking about problems in a different way, 
we can overcome and defy the odds, a little bit like David, the first hacker, um, with a culture that will sustain this ability and unlock it more and more with the people as challenges evolve and accomplish the mission that we're here to do. Thank you very much.